This is the BBC. And welcome. This is another Confessions podcast from your friends at BBC Radio 2, where we produce jingles like this for a Friday. Slightly shorter version, really, this one. Just to prove this is the real article, you know. It's like a, like a, a maker's mark. Anyway, here come the Confessions, and uh, this week's Concise Collection features Take Me Home Country Roads... Uh, Blowing in the Wind, No G. Uh, it's got some pants involved. One Bad Apple and You Drive Me Crazy. That's what we called this week's confessions. Here come all four. This one comes from Jim. That's Jim, J-I-M for you, Bobby. Dear Father oh, Simon. Can you spell that? <clears throat> yeah, it's always helpful. And The Forgiving Fellowship. Although I was present at this sobering tale of drunk logic, I was unable to do anything as I was but a nipper. I actually write to seek forgiveness for my father, now sadly, sadly two years deceased, as well as a village bowls team. Yes, an entire team. Most of the protagonists have passed on, but I hope that with your forgiveness, any sensation of heat and crackling noises may be replaced by clouds and grade three harp lessons. OK. You with us? Mm-hmm. <laughs> is it not going down there? Is it going yeah. down? Oh, yes, you yes, 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 no, I got okay, that. You're looking yeah. puzzled. Yeah. I was just, you yeah. know. Yeah. <clears throat> Such is the power of this feature. <laughs> yes, clearly. <laughs> Redemption can be yours. I take you back to the late 1970s. My parents and I lived in a village in Surrey. There was a factory on the outskirts where my father worked with its own bowls club, and he always organised a summer away match. This particular year, the team's opponents were in Bournemouth, and a coach was organised, and the team with families piled on for a day of sun, sea and sexy bowls action. If there is such a thing, which apparently there is. Well, let's hope so. That's, and they were, that's what they were heading off for. A great day was had by all, but when everyone reconvened at the coach, the roads were solid as sun-scorched families were also making their way home. The coach driver recommended that a pub was sought until the roads cleared. Obviously, everyone agreed, and, a luckily, and luckily a large enough venue was handy and nearby. Everyone piled in and instantly struck up friendly conversations with the locals, as there were no mobile phones to stare at. The pub didn't have a jukebox, but there was a piano in the corner of the bar. When the lack of music was noted, an elderly patron said he played the piano. Thus, a friendly deal was struck. He was to play the piano in exchange for a coach party buying him drinks in gratitude. I believe I was sat outside with a bottle of cola. As I said, I was a nipper. Uh, this was the standard 1970s approach to child rearing. Yes, we all remember that. All the parents yeah. inside. Yeah. You'll be all right with you for a few hours. <laughs> and only ready salted with yeah. a little bag yeah. of salt. Thank you. However, as late afternoon turned to early evening, the piano playing went from Jules Holland to Les Dawson (laughs) and then to school orchestra standard. It transpired that everyone was buying him drinks, not just one or two, in a fit of politeness, and it's fair to say after an hour or so, the piano player was quite refreshed. (laughs) Unable to even stand, the landlord declared the man should probably be accompanied home. However, it soon turned out that he wasn't all that well known to the locals. My father fished through his pockets and found some car keys and a found some car and house keys, plus a wallet, which thankfully contained a driving licence. The man was from Waterlooville. For those not well versed in Hampshire geography, Waterlooville is a town 50 miles east of Bournemouth and eight miles north of Portsmouth on the main London to Portsmouth Road. Obviously, Bobby, you know all this, but I'm just, for those who don't know the roads around I could have given you those specifics, yeah. Thank you. With an easy detour, this journey could be incorporated into the itinerary back to Surrey. And so my father and his friends took a momentous decision. In the spirit of the Good Samaritan, we were going to do the decent thing. We were going to get this man home safely. (coughs) Excuse me. We therefore set off on our now extended journey, and eventually we reached the piano player's address. The man was completely out for the count by this point, so fishing his keys back out from his pocket, a small expedition party carried the man out of the coach and carried him inside his bungalow. They got his shoes and outer garments off and they put him safely to bed. Father Simon, on behalf of my father and a village bowls team, I seek forgiveness from the piano-playing elder for nearly killing him with kindness. However, I particularly seek forgiveness for what happened next. Oh, dear. 
The racket caused by the drunks trying to act quietly got the curtains twitching and a few neighbours came out to see what the noise was all about. It's quite unusual to have, like, a coach just parked outside. This included the next-door neighbour who inquired what had happened. My father says, well, it's your neighbour. He had a bit, bit too much to drink, so we did the decent thing. We brought him home. The neighbour looked slightly puzzled and said, well... That's funny. He's gone on holiday to Bournemouth with his wife. <laughs> he, he went the other day. <laughs> so, so. For drunk childlike logic leading to incapacitation and abduction, however friendly its intention, for an elderly man waking up with a severe hangover and a set of keys to a car and a holiday with his wife 50 miles away, I throw myself at your mercy. Thank you, Jim. There were there were only the best of intentions yes. here. It just turned out he didn't want to go home. <laughs> he was quite happily just having a drink in the pub. Next thing he knows, he's back at home. He, that would have been something else. How on earth? Did, where have you gone? I suppose it's not funny from the point of view of his other half, who might have been thinking, well, where's he gone? How long would it have taken until they were reunited? Anyway, Sister Bobby. The thing is, I never forgive, do I? I really forgive. That's the observation. Uh, but it's... Uh, the thing is, like you said, is every good intention. They didn't know, but that's a lovely twist, and I didn't see that coming at all. The thing is, of course, the real danger is leaving somebody on their own drunk anyway. You know, you hope he slept it off, but, you know, a word of caution. But I think it's very, very easy, Jim, on behalf of your dad, actually, to forgive your dad, because, like I said, all good intentions. But never assume, you see. That's the word of caution. Never assume. You would have, you would have thought that Mrs Piano Player might have piped up at... Or maybe she wasn't there. Otherwise, she might have said, it's all right, I'll look after him from here. What would be worse, if she was waiting for him to be picked up when she'd just gone to get fish and chips? Oh, let's not bother too much about that now. Uh, well, <laughs> yes. I mean, I'm going to guess that she wasn't in the pub or else she'd have said something. I, I, I'm I, definitely going to forgive because this is a great story, but I, I would love to think about this guy waking up the next morning <laughs> and going... What on earth? Did I dream that we went on holiday? Because I'm pretty sure that wasn't a dream. I thought we were on holiday. Maybe and yet here I am at home. And um, where's my wife? Why is my wife not? What's happened? Uh, excellent. Lovely. Uh, so, yes, definitely going to forgive. Dear Father Simon and the Collective, thank you, Cece, for this email. I have been carrying around this guilt for many years. As a mother now in her 50th year... This has been deeply buried in my conscience since I was a tender and somewhat naive 19 years old. As a student at the University of Kent, but living in the Midlands, when I did travel between university and home, it was only once a term, as it was a long, long way, and I always did it by bus. My journey began at the National Express Coach Depot at Digbeth in Birmingham, a joy of a place for anyone else who's frequented this destination of travel delights back in the mid-80s. Actually, travelling to Canterbury was a dream, having once done a 34-hour bus trip back from Geneva with a chipped hip bone. This was as a result of being thrown from an unruly horse whilst on holiday. It is true I am not an equestrian. It's a little detour. Wow. I think. Yes, very nice. 34-hour trip on a bus with a chipped hip Goodness is me. not a good idea. Yeah. Having alighted from the number 37 local bus and milky tea and a wagon wheel consumed in Digbeth's salubrious tea room, I saw the number 32 to London's Victoria Station pull into its bay. I was to travel to London, change at Victoria Station for the connecting bus to Canterbury. Yellow Walkman fully charged, listening to Talking Heads, Robert Palmer and Joe Jackson on my trusty C90 tapes, I took my seat. Here we go. So many cultural Ooh, references. Back, isn't it? Not just Talking Heads and C90s, but a wagon wheel oh. as well. <laughs> when they were big. Yeah, before they got all small. Mm. Why did that happen? Oh, I know. I had borrowed a very cool new skirt from a friend, which was the height of fashion. It was floral to the ankle, but with two huge slits up either side. With my natty hat, cream lacy blouse, large scarf and pixie boots, I felt I looked the business. Yeah. yeah I think, I think Matt, good. I've got a picture of you in, in a uh, similar yeah, kind of outfit. Floral, yeah, very much rocking that. So that's natty hat, creamy lace blouse, Jack. large scarf, pixie boots, Boom. and a floral dress to the ankle with two huge splits up either side. We sped past Spaghetti Junction onto the M6, the M1, and into the big smoke. I sat back and rested looking forward to the term ahead. The changeover at Victoria Coach Station always involved a long wait. 
Seemingly, bus timetables were never particularly well synced for travelling folk with a fair distance to cover. Killing time at Victoria Station was never easy. I had no money and the Walkman batteries were now flat. So I decided that maybe going for a wee and a freshen up would help break the boredom of standing around coach spotting. I descended the stairs to the ladies' loo, no freaking annoying steel barrier in those days, and a ridiculous 30p charge, just a nice friendly toilet assistant and a manky saucer to drop some loose change onto. Ablution's done, I returned to wait for my onwards bus to Canterbury. Lovely. You don't know who this past. <laughs> so I walked around for a while, past queues of people, past shops, past a few cafes, people eating their donuts. I actually picked up an old copy of the NME, which I found on the ground. And after a while, a middle-aged lady tapped me somewhat tentatively on the shoulder. Presuming she was going to ask me the time, or when a bus was due or something, I was a little perturbed when she actually said, I don't know how to tell you this, oh, no. but you've got your skirt tucked into your pants. <laughs> oh, no. On both sides. <laughs> well, Father Simon... I was so embarrassed. I turned to check and she was absolutely right. Everything was on show. For reasons I can't fathom, though, I smiled and said, I know. <laughs> as, as though I'd done it on purpose. Yeah, yeah. When really I was trying to cover up complete devastation. What I have regretted to tell you, because there was no need until this point, was that I was actually wearing a G-string that day. So my behind had been on display for all of London Victoria Station people to witness. So, so I need to confess that the lovely passenger had the nerve to tell me that I was completely unaware. I was essentially flashing and did not have the decency to thank her. I'd also like to apologise to the families because there were children involved who were in the queues, all the people eating their donuts in the cafes, <laughs> for, for spoiling their afternoon. Mum, what's that woman doing? Oh, yes. Why is she picking up that paper? Mm. And for not warning my friend when I returned the skirt to take extreme caution with choice of underwear when sporting this particular garment... Well, it's CC. Well, it's basically it's a straightforward tale. It's a wardrobe malfunction, and you have to be very careful with some modes of dress. That's just the thing. Why she actually said, I know, <laughs> rather than, gosh, that's embarrassing. Thank you for... Who knows? In the height of embarrassment. That's what, that's what she said. Anyway, uh, Sister Bobby. Oh, dear. So the thing is, if you've worn a frock and, you know... I'm not saying yes. every girl has or every man has. It's likely that at some point the, the it's edge, quite easy, the hem is going to. It just does. It's just what happens. And on lucky, both sides. Well, though? well, the thing is, it was a split up the middle, so it depends how you hang it in, how, how you kind of tuck it in. But it's look. I've, it's, I'm not going to say it's happened to all of us because that would be wrong. It's happened to many of us. It's happened to me so many times. I can't tell you. It's not even funny anymore. But it's if you're walking, what and what a place to do it though. But you're... Victoria, the thing is, is. And it, this is so easily forgiven because you didn't do it on purpose. But there is a kind of there is a point that like, you're going to lose at the moment because you wore a thong and that's where it goes wrong. Because really, if you wear a frock, you always have to wear really big pants for safety, <laughs> properly, so, or even spanks. That's what I do. I never wear a frock a without what? something really major underneath because you just know there's going to be a gust of wind that's just going to take it all up. And also, thongs are never good unless you've got the perfect <laughs> behind. And I'd have thought with chilly cheeks you'd have known, but um, so really, full, 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 so full. it's kind of Cece's fault. Well, then. no, it's not her fault. But saying? no, what I'm saying is it can happen to any of us. You might have done it on purpose. No, I I don't think she did. You don't do that on purpose. Okay. So, Cece, you're forgiven, but not for wearing a thong. Big Chilly pants cheeks. next time. Big pants are the answer to everything, Matt. Well done. Um, I am going... I mean, obviously, we're going to forgive because I mean, this is a very funny story and, and, and she's not done anything deliberately at all. I've changed well, coaches at Digbeth and at Victoria and you just sit there, your life ebbing away and the very idea that someone would be going past while I was having a donut with their uh, with their skirt tucked <laughs> into their uh, g-string oh indeed then oh, suddenly <laughs> the day is taken an upturn so I'm gonna forget Uh, gather around, it's another Drive Time Confession. If you miss any, the Confessions podcast is there for you, uh, bbc.co.uk. You go to the radio website, you can download it all from there. iTunes will have it as well. If you missed any from last week, there's a whole bunch that you can catch up on. And you can send in your confessions. Got its own email, confessions at bbc.co.uk. The uh, juggernauts of justice are sitting oh, ready. Yes. And, I need ready, to get that T-shirt in again. Ready and poised. And it, could you have another one made for Bobby? Yes. A better. smaller one. Like a quarter of your size. Oh, hello. Yes, could you manage that? Thanks very much. So whoever sent, sent you the last one, can we have, just, another one? have another one? You're taller than me and bigger yes. than me. 
Uh, this one came comes from A in Cambridgeshire, just the letter A. That's all it is, about a, as anonymous as possible, but it comes from Cambridgeshire. Simon, in fact, this is one of the confessions that has a line in it which goes, to this day, my mum doesn't know what happened. Oh, really? And I always like those because you think, OK, yeah. even though it's not a horrendous thing, the consequences have been <gasps> rippling through the years. Simon and the Collective Forgiveness crew. This confession takes me back to 1987 when I was a 13-year-old schoolboy living on my parents' farm in Lincolnshire. Now, living on a farm and having the only football pitch slash big lawn in the surrounding area, my summer holidays were never boring. Friends descended on the farm on their bikes to play football and spend time playing outside, climbing on straw bales and other potentially hazardous activities. These were great times fuelled by orange squash and the soda stream machine. There you go. That's what you had to have. On this particular day, I was with my two best friends. Let's call them Paul and Ian. We decided to give the football a rest and build a straw bale den and have a game of war. Have you ever played war? I've never played no, war. I've never played war. No. no Xbox back then. Different times, says A in Cambridgeshire. It's August, so the large Dutch barn was filled with straw bales recently collected from the fields, and in earnest we began construction, building machine gun nests, bunkers and shelters. As we moved the bales around, we quite often came across a variety of cute farmyard animals, mice, rats and birds living in the stack. On this particular occasion, we came across a large wood pigeon, which unfortunately had sadly passed away. We are continuing with the pigeon theme, by the way. Yes, we which are. Which has now been running for yeah. a while. I Aww. like this pigeon theme. It was that sadness for the, Aww, yeah. the pigeon that has passed away. We, anyway, it sadly passed away, we assume, by flying into one of the many beams in the shed. Not to sound callous, but we thought nothing of this at this time, as it was not an unusual sight on the farm. So we carried on with our construction. We'll come back to the pigeon later. Our story now moves on a couple of hours. We'd been playing war. Very. What is war good for? Absolutely nothing. <laughs> but if you're playing it, again. it, it's quite fun. <laughs> <laughs> We've been playing it very competitively with two of us attacking the newly constructed straw bunker and the other one defending. Several arguments of, I shot you, no you didn't, I so did. <laughs> they, didn't they didn't say they that. They didn't say that in 87. 87. <laughs> no. I so did. <laughs> no, but you know what I'm saying. Um, anyway, but all in all, we were having a great time. Our guns were manufactured from old bits of wood found in our yard and our grenades were large cooking apples plucked from the tree in front of the farmhouse and yes they did hurt all was going well until ian decided to launch a counter-attack out of the den with his machine gun which is an old table leg and two apple grenades recovered from the roof of the den paul and i were concealed in our garden outpost from behind the garden hedge ian launches his surprise grenade attack with a shout of grenade a large green cooking apple came sailing over the hedge. Time stood still as this giant green projectile sailed towards us and then over us and straight through the middle of the pane of glass in the farmhouse front door with a large smash, leaving a large hole, glass everywhere and a cooking apple inside mm. the house. What have you done? We screamed. Ian came running around to survey the damage. We got away with things before, but how were we going to get out of this? No pocket money for a year or what? as we also didn't say in 1987. <laughs> Fortunately, circumstances were in our favour. My dad was still at work, my mum was still at the shops, but due back soon. We retrieved the guilty apple from the house and then stood staring at the hole in the glass, a circular hole in the glass. We stood there trying to work out what to do and then it came to me in a moment of inspiration. The pigeon. <laughs> <laughs> oh, had the pigeon good. died for no reason yes. I don't think so I explained the plan to the others as we ran to the bale stack and when we arrived I gently picked up the deceased pigeon and carried it in my arms to the house where I laid it in position in the hall where the pigeon had landed Paul and Ian agreed it was probably best if they weren't around when I hatched this plan, as it's easier to lie to your own parents, and they were sure to crack under the pressure. They sped home on their bikes. After an agonising wait, my mum returned home from shopping and immediately noticed the damage. Taking a deep breath, I began to tell an extraordinary tale of how we were playing in the garden, and a pigeon had swooped down like a, like a stucker. That's a Stuka. Stuka. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. It's a plane, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. And flown straight into the front door, smashing the glass. What were the chances? I finished the very exaggerated tale and waited for my mum to see right through me. However, when she smiled and uttered the words, "Oh, the poor thing," 
A bit like Bobby did mm. when we said, oh. Aww. I knew I had pulled off the perfect crime. Here's the line. To this day, my mum still doesn't know the truth. My parents still live in the same house, and every time I walk past the front door, I still smile to myself. Paul and Ian still talk about it to this day. We therefore seek forgiveness from my mum for lying about us smashing the door and wasting all of her cooking apples every summer as grenades. I also seek forgiveness from the unfortunate pigeon for using its untimely death to save our hides. Well, you know, I think the pigeon just died of natural flying into beam sort of causes. And um, I, I think most people are going to feel quite generously towards you, A, but let's check out Sister Bobby, who never forgives, unless she does. This has been a tricky week, because I have forgiven <coughs> almost every day, and a couple of days last week, so, you know, very on short supply on a roll. However, I'm really inspired by your kind of use of props, and it's really difficult to lie for your mum, but also... You did it to protect your friends because you didn't want to get everyone in trouble, which well, that's what happened, wouldn't it? All three of you would have stood there and you'd all been in for it. However, you shouldn't waste cooking apples as grenades. That's oh, my see. point. But actually, I tell you what, on this count, oh, because really? you were so smart, I'm going to forgive you. Yeah, I mean, wow. it, yes, I think, I th well, I, I know. Twisted and turned there, didn't it? Yeah, I just didn't didn't forgive you because actually I thought it was really smart. Brother Matthew. Uh, I'm going to forgive uh, because it's ingenious, isn't it? To have this hole in the window and then realise, aha, we've got that dead wood pigeon we can use. And what's that, you know, what's the mum going to do? She, she's not going to get all CSI on this and start dusting for feathers and oh, hang on that that bird didn't possibly make that round hole in the in the in the window so i am going to forgive because uh it was a great idea and well done and the fact that she doesn't know now even better gather around here comes another drive time confession tonight's coming from biggles and the squadron <laughs> thanks biggles and the squadron yeah. uh You'll notice already from the chundering that uh, the novice is in no. full effect. I think it's chuntering rather than... Not in your case. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, on, on tonight's homework question, uh, which is one of them, which is about the difference between the two types of poaching, top gag from Bobby, who said... Either way, you end up in hot water. There you go. Boom. Before yes. anyone else claims it. Good. Uh, and that, uh, those answers coming into Simon Mayo at bbc.co.uk. Uh, confessions, please, to confessions at bbc.co.uk. Biggles says, <laughs> Dear wise, supremely indulgent, understanding, yet remarkably impartial, tolerant collective, I seek the wisdom and dispensation from my past sins and the error of my ways. Is that obsequious enough? Answer, no. Let's find out. My confession relates back over 41 years to student days. The time, an early Sunday morning, February 1976. The location, a North Midlands red brick university, the highest in the land, altitude-wise, and close by to well-known service motorway services on the M6. Dialect required, North Staffordshire slash Stoke. Dream on! You'll just have to fit the normal mm. pattern. Well, yep. I'm just <clears throat> saying, I think I've worked out which university, which we're not going to say. We're not going to say the university, not? obviously not. Cause, Why not? Because we're not supposed to say where it is. Think ships. <laughs> anyway, <clears throat> the North Staffordshire Stoke accent is a very precise accent. Uh, I bet you're good at this one because you come from that's your manner, isn't it? No, Ish. it's not. I'm North London and I... <laughs> well, you were born in London, but you grew up in, in, in the not, Midlands. I, I spent some time in Birmingham and in the East Midlands, specifically Beeston... And they don't have a North Staffordshire accent in Beeston. Consequently, the accent will be what it will be. <laughs> OK, good. Following an evening of convivial imbibing with fellow students, a group of us were making our way back to our halls of residence via the obligatory visit to the pie and chips van outside the Union. Mushy peas with that duck! See what I mean? <laughs> that could, could have been... Yeah. <clears throat> I mean, it could be mushy peas with that duck. Yes, I think that's the one think you want to go with next time. I don't yeah. think they're serving duck at the pie and chips van. To ensure that our good friend Colin did not miss out on the celebration of his birthday, as he had earnestly remained in his room writing a law essay, it was decided that we should provide him with a surprise present that he could find in the morning as he went to breakfast in halls. Thus we decided that we should gift-wrap his car, which is a blue Italian Fiat, by the way. Uh, as as all Fiat's are, Italian. Anyway, it, we decided to gift wrap it as a present. However, we needed the appropriate paper to wrap his surprise. What should we use to do this? Old copies of The Morning Star and Socialist Worker from Common Rooms, maybe? Old essays or project papers? Chip wrappers. 
Who can say? Eventually it dawned on us that we realised that the most abundant material available to us was toilet paper, which was readily available in every cubicle in the respective halls and there would be plenty as the toilets were well stocked for the weekend. Each member of the group was dispatched to the halls to collect the toilet rolls and bring them back to the car for the grand wrapping. The night was cold, still bright and dry, and the wrapping of the car began with gusto. One of our members was nimble and most dexterous in getting the paper under the car and up and over the top so that he could craft a knotted ribbon on top of the car's roof. How beautiful. However, such was our enthusiasm for the wrapping that we quickly ran out of paper. So again, we dispatched once again to find more toilet rolls from the remaining blocks around the halls, including those in the refectory. Having found sufficient paper, we finished the job by ensuring no area of the paintwork and glass was left exposed. We all stood back in the glittering night and admired our handiwork before deciding that we should adjourn to bed at that early hour of the morning. We were well satisfied and were sure that our studious friend would be greatly impressed, as well by our kind and thoughtful gesture on his birthday. However, there was a flaw in our plan. Namely, we hadn't anticipated the weather. Within an hour of our present wrapping, the car became sodden, following a refreshing heavy shower. Almost immediately, there was a sudden dip in temperatures before dawn. And so not only was the paper stuck to the car, but it was icy solid too. However, the paper gang did not find out the state of the present until much later that Sunday morning, as we slumbered on, oblivious to the gathering consternation outside in the university. As the residents of the halls woke from sleep and went to perform their morning ablutions, they were soon to discover that there was no toilet paper in their shared bathrooms. Despite frantic searching and much cussing, there was none to be found anywhere. Only later did we hear that the union shop had done a brisk business in toilet rolls and boxes of tissues sold to the students from the halls who stripped their entire stock that morning. As we sleepyheads emerged from our pits around lunchtime in order to regroup at an off-campus hostelry, we noticed the familiar figure of Colin, still in his pyjamas and dressing gown, fresh from quoting numerous cases in his essay, trying to prize lumps of rock-solid papier-mâché from his car, because that's how it was. It was now absolutely solid. At the at the same time, he was getting disgusted stares from students returning from the shop with their supply of toilet paper. Colin was getting the blame. And so, dear collective, whilst we did make it up to him later, I still feel a twinge of guilt that Colin, after spending the whole of his birthday night working on his taut essay, then had to spend his Sunday scraping papier-mâché off his car. However... It is from my fellow students that I seek most forgiveness from the, uh, for the inconvenience and the uncomfortable start to their Sunday, seeking suitably supplied WCs or rushing down the hill to the union shop to make up for the shortfall of loo roll. After 41 years, I'm sure that there will be some residents of those blocks who will remember the discomfort that I and my small group selfishly put them through that day. Thus, I prostrate myself before the gathered, compassionate collective for your forgiveness for my wayward ways during my student pass and trust Trust that Colin is enjoying a much better birthday this February. Lots of love, Biggles and his paper squadron. So, student pranks. I know, I think I know. Now, Bobby is going to have to compensate for her forgiving state earlier and is going to go hard. Nigel, I predict, is going to forgive Matt because it's got a reference to halls. Uh, we'll go all class warfare on it. Anyway, that's my prediction. I might be entirely wrong, Bobby Pryor. Uh, yes, uh, there are three points here. First of all, Colin got the blame for it. Which is, and it wasn't his fault. Secondly, no one could go to the bathroom properly in the morning, and that wasn't fair. I know, hijinks, unsuspecting consequences. But the other thing you did is you wrapped up a present, he, the car he already had. It's not like you got him a car that he wanted. It's the fact that well, there was no real surprise, really, was there? You just basically ruined his lovely car. So you're not forgiven. Yeah. Biggles in the squadron. OK, well, that's, I got one out of one, so let's see, Nigel. It was a jape. And also, uh, I, I mean... Anyone who thought that Colin would wrap his own car up in loo paper is, is bonkers. I mean, an, an Italian Fiat, a blue one at that, who would have heard of it? Yeah. Uh, I, I wonder if he's still practising. There might have been a legal precedent, a ratio decedendi, set at the time. Um, but, <laughs> you were uh, determined to get that in, weren't you? Absolutely. 
<laughs> Biggles flies undone on this occasion. Uh, so you are absolutely forgiven. Oh, to add it to. <laughs> OK. Brother Matthew. Well, um, I, here's what I remember from student halls, is no-one ever went to the loo without their own toilet roll, because there was no point, because when you got there, it would obviously already be gone. So, frankly, any student in those halls who was surprised when they got to their cubicle and found that there was no um, toilet roll only has themselves to blame, because we all know you take your loo roll with you, uh, use it, and then and then take it back to your room. So, uh, I, and, and seeing as the bulk of the forgiveness is about the students, I'm going to say forgiven, because you're supposed to take your loo roll with you, and then and it's a bonus if there's any in there already. But so, not, it's you know. not a campsite, is it? You know, you, it's, you, you, well, maybe, well, maybe well, we, we, we yeah. obviously stayed in different <laughs> halls. Well, they were this week's confessions. Uh, if you have your own deep and dark secret, maybe inspired by one of those, confessions at bbc.co.uk. And if you missed any of our shows this week, you can listen back online or download to your smartphone or tablet the BBC iPlayer radio app. So I'm going to tell you all about the stuff that you might have missed while playing you a Radio 2 jingle, which is called ID Daft Pop Ramp. OK, you'll hear why it's a ramp in a moment. So on Monday, the Ready 2 Book Club welcomed J.P. Delaney, talking about his Ron Howard endorsed psychological thriller, The Girl Before. Shappy Corsandi on Tuesday had a chat about her pigeons. Wednesday, Simon Callow talking Wagner. And Nigel on Thursday, the chilli beef hash. So you hear, hear how it's ramped, see? Hence the ramp. Like a radio masterclass, this. And if you made it to the end of last week's podcast, I ask you to tweet the message, you give me tuppence and I'll give you Zultzwang, which has slightly misinterpreted and spelt incorrectly. But anyway, thanks to Swanee, Andrew Flack and Marching Tonic, uh, amongst the many who actually did tweet that. Uh, this week's big code phrase is lava, 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 for obvious reasons. Thanks for listening. 